The Curious Case of Natalia Grace. It's about this dwarf, uh, alleged dwarf. I mean, no, she is a dwarf. She's actually, she's an actual yeah, dwarf. Yeah, she's not alleged. She is one. No, she's yeah. an actual dwarf, <laughs> alleged right. child at the time and of the right. adoption. And that was in dispute, how, just how old she was. So she was from Ukraine and she got adopted by Michael and Christine Barnett. So here's a bit, I think this is from the trailer, but here is Michael Barnett, who is reason enough to watch this series. This is the adoptive father, who is one of the most colorful characters I've ever beheld in a television series. I, uh, listen to him talking about what happened after they adopted what they thought was a six-year-old Ukrainian girl. So we get to the hotel that night, and Christine's going to give our brand new daughter a bath. And I hear a shout from the bathroom. This was a, I'm not playing around, come here right now, Michael, shout. I get up, I go fly into the bathroom, and the color's almost gone from her face. It's almost like she's seen a ghost. She's, she's truly frightened, and she just doesn't know what she's seeing and what's going on. She says, Michael, Michael, look, look down. And Natalia had full pubic hair. And I don't know what to think. Google's telling us, well, earliest possible time, lowest common denominator, eight. So we just go, okay, look, our mission, we, we were going to show love and compassion to somebody that never had it before. That doesn't make a difference. There was a day I came home from work. Christine's got a pair of Natalia's underwear. Christine asked Natalia to tell me what's going on. I remember her, her, her physicalness at the time. Her hands were just out in front of her like this. And she said, well, I have a period and I've been hiding it. And I, I just don't know what's going on right now. So they live with this person, child, right? They're not sure now what, what exactly is the age of this person that they've adopted. And they start to see what they say is very disturbing behavior. Um, they think she's six, but now they have real questions about whether she's six. And the father, the adoptive father, Michael, tells, among other stories, this story about when they all went to I think it was a Christmas tree farm or a farm all together. What happened with their newly adopted, quote, little girl? I turn and look. Natalia and Christine are in a physical altercation. It looks like Natalia's trying to pull Christine. Now, you might think, hey, she's a little person. How strong can she be? She uses her arms a lot push herself up on things. She goes up the stairs using her arms. She's got guns that Schwarzenegger would be impressed with. She's very strong. My wife is frail. She's got a degenerative disease called lupus. She's weak. I start to go back. Christine says, no, go. Okay. She wants my son to have his birthday. We go. And me and the boys double time it. We get a little bit farther down, and we hear the sirens. The second I heard the sirens, I thought Christine was dead. Okay, you gotta watch the whole series in order to fully appreciate all that the family says happened. They come to believe that the person they've adopted is not six, but is 21 years old that she was not born in 2003 or 2004. She was born in 1989. And that this whole thing has been a ruse, potentially by this Ukrainian mother, potentially by Natalia Grace. I don't know who who is in on it, the, ale the alleged scheme. But they are like, not only is she not telling the truth, but she's a scammer and she's dangerous. She, she tried to kill my wife. So they get rid of her. They find an apartment and they move this, quote, daughter, they're now saying is an adult, into the apartment, like 
unsupervised, which if she's really 21 is not a problem, but if she's six or nine, <laughs> whatever, it is. Yada, yada, a court has a hearing because they get brought in on child neglect charges under the auspices of you put a nine-year-old in an apartment by yourself, you're bad adoptive parents. And they are persuasive enough that the judge says, you know what? I accept that she was born in 1989. They revise the birth certificate and the judge throws out the charges against them. Okay, now season two comes out. Natalia Grace says she really was six. I, don't, I haven't done the math. It's like six to eight when they adopted her. That they were lying. She wasn't born in 1989. They put a little girl, a nine-year-old, in a damned apartment by herself. And not to worry because she has found a new set of adoptive parents to like help her out, even though now she's definitely older. Uh, if she was born, if she was actually born in 2004, she's an adult now, legally. But here she is saying, we took a DNA test and the DNA test proves today in 2023, I guess when this was filmed, I am 22 years old. So I I was a, a little girl when they adopted me in SOT 5. Watch this. They knew it and they still did what they did. This one little piece of paper throws every single lie that the Barnett's has said right into the trash with a match. This is so big because literally this has been 13 years, 13 years of just two people lying their butts off. Okay. So she's found redemption with a new adoptive family that's gonna, she says, take care of her and shepherd her through the civil lawsuits that she says she's going to unleash against the Be the Barnetts, Michael and Christine. So before I get to the stunning epilogue of this thing, um, does she have a civil lawsuit against that first family? And can she revive or seek to revive these old criminal charges that were dismissed for child neglect that were dismissed based on the court's belief that she was in fact mm -hmm born in 1989, not in 2003 or whenever. This is so, it's, you, can't, you can't make it up. Uh, Mark, I'll give that one to you to start. <laughs> thanks a lot. I, I talk about a, uh, <laughs> thanks a, uh, about a law review uh, question. <laughs> I, uh, as far as reviving criminal charges, I don't know how they would do that, or uh, that would be the prosecutorial uh, decision. I can't imagine that they could do that when they've got a court that has blessed it, unless there's some other auxiliary charge that they, a prosecutor would want to bring. If the prosecutor believes believe that the the parents had done this willfully or maliciously. I well, mean, that's that, it, yeah, right? Like, it, it, let's that. say, let's say they can bring it somehow. Yeah. The defense is going to be, we, we believed she was a grown up. It's exactly right. And we believed it so much that uh, we went through the court system and the court believed us as well. So, John, uh, I mean, criminally and honestly, civilly too, like, mm -hmm. I guess, do they need to prove that these were just terrible people who knew that it was a six-year-old or six to eight and couldn't deal with her? So they made up this lie? Like that the whole, the pubic hair, the period, like those were all lies? Or this is just like, how are they gonna get past what seems like a legitimate belief by the parents that this kid was older than she was saying? So I have questions. And the first one is, how is it possible that a surrogate court judge changed a, a, a person's birth certificate without some sort of serious expert medical testimony, numero uno? Number two, I, I mean, I suppose because if they didn't go through that process, which I didn't even know you could do, I'll be honest with you guys, I'm doing this a long time, didn't know you could go to a surrogate court judge and say, see this kid here, not a kid. If she's 22, <laughs> change the birth certificate. Like and I didn't know did. that I, was even possible. They did go through the process, on, for sure. They did. And if that wasn't part of the equation, then I think there is criminal liability for sure, because then they're just taking a kid that, if you just think 
your six-year-old is really 22. Now, now you've got the problem. And I think they could have been criminally prosecuted. But because the, the intervention of the surrogate court actually legitimizing their crime, if you think about it, then, uh, you know, that you can't go after that judge. So I think that that's, that's going to lay dead. You know, they're not going to do anything. Them. Yeah, I think yeah, that does. It, it, absolutely. It, it, it immunizes them to the degree that the, they've gone to a court. The court made a decision. I don't know how you get around that unless you say that there was fraud in the uh, inducement there of some right. kind. Like they, they defrauded the first court with whatever documents or testimony they submitted. Correct. And I, I mean, good Correct. luck proving all of that. But what could she possibly, mm -hmm. like if she came into your office and said, I want to sue them, okay, the, the criminal law is not going to go after them, but I want to sue them for all the pain and suffering they've put me through. Poor little me. I didn't do any of those terrible things. So not only did they kick me out and put me alone, but now they've disparaged me in this movie and said I did all these terrible things and I'm I'm actually a very sweet person. I'm just a kid. What, what's the lawsuit? No, oh, she might have some cause of action, but the real question is going to be how much do they have? Because if they're not filthy rich and she's not going to get a lot of money, maybe. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Leo Grillo. Leo was on a road trip and came across a Doberman. This dog was severely underweight and clearly in trouble. And Leo rescued him and named him Delta. Sadly, as you know, Delta is just one of so many animals that needed and continue to need help. And that inspired Leo to start Delta Rescue, the largest no-kill, that's important to listen for, care for life animal sanctuary in the world. They have rescued thousands of dogs, cats, and horses from the wilderness, and they provide their animals with shelter, love, safety, and a home. It's dedication and everlasting love to animals. That's Leo's mission and his legacy. Delta Rescue relies solely on contributions to stay open. And if you would like caring for these animals to be part of your legacy, speak with your estate planner because there are tax saving estate planning benefits to you as well. You can grow your estate while letting your love for animals live well into the future. Check out the estate planning tab on their website to learn more and speak with your advisor. We call dog a man's best friend for a reason. You can help those who need it most. Visit deltarescue.org today to learn more. That's deltarescue.org. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.